somebody made me aware of a little mistake or something. I mentioned it here. I put it on my blog site. We talked about use value and exchange value. And the astronauts, the US, inventing, investing a huge amount of money and inventing this special pen and spending, as I said, a huge amount of money. And, and the Russians simply taking a, a pencil. And I received a message that this would not be true. And apparently uh, an enterprise, I don't know from where, invented this thing uh, after both had been struggling with the same problem. And I mention this, first of all, thanks for making me aware of it. I, I didn't bother really. I took it more or less as a joke. But I mention it here because it shows how important referencing is. I put the source of it linked to the text. I think it's on Blackboard as well. Okay. So I put it on, on, the, on the internet, but I mentioned the site, the, the source as well. Which basically means I did not make a mistake. The mistake I made was I didn't check and didn't look if there's different information on it. But at least if it comes to your essays or whatsoever you write, you put your source on it, which means it's not what I say, but it is what has been said there. Meaning always use the reference, make it clear from where you have it, and then basically everything is fine. Of course, if it is about serious scientific work, research, you should double check if there is contradicting information or uh, if there is additional reference available. But that's the basic principle. Now here I have the reference for the photo, which had been made by one of your classmates. And she presented as well uh, last time on this. And I said at some stage, the end is the emoticon. The end is an emotion. You just put this thing onto your widget or onto whatsoever. And it's most likely that the communication stops there. Because you make a strong statement, you, you, you say, this is my emotion about it. You communicate it in words, you exchange opinions, you did this and that, and then you say, basically, full stop. Smiling, sad, what's up? But at the same time, this emotion, if you want, is the beginning of it. You see something, which is a sensual act, but it is as well something emotional. She saw many, many different things, a minute before and a minute after. But, but this was something catching the attention, which is, at least to some extent, it is emotion. It's emotional. You bring it to the point. And you see actually what is in it. And she talked about it, Catherine talked about it. It is this guy who is working and making it possible for the brother to study. And then other things came up. What is the responsibility of public bodies to support it, to make it possible for both to study, and then it. We talked about all this in a different context. Austrian, public goods, private goods. Um, Polanyi, marketization, commodification of everything. How, are, how is wealth distributed? So this is something where we get this impression and then we start, depending on our discipline basically, to bring an order into it. Because of course the photo is just an impression there are many, many different things in it. And if I look at the photo, I can simply say it's in terms of colors. 
It, it looks nearly like, like designed. Just go there, this is contrast, this bright color. This is what, what a photographer would do, looking at the different shades of brown and under. Purely under this condition, under this, in this perspective, you would not be interested in what are they actually doing. Now, for us, it was, it's of course different. And as I said, we have different ways of defining things. We have here the, there is chaos, and then we have here the buckets with the showers or tools. We could take as well a di different perspective. We could say here the yellow things, then the blue things, then the red things, things like this, different order. But we are, that's the perspective, we are studying economics. And you will find many different definitions of what economics is. Standard definitions, sometimes contradicting definitions. And then you have something that is by and large agreed upon. Robin's most famous book was an essay on the nature and significance of economic science, one of the best written prose pieces in economics. That book contains three main thoughts. First, Robbins, famous all-encompassing uh, definition of economics that is still used to define the subject today. And now, actually, there come three points with this. Economics is the science which studies human behavior. This is important. We are not studying equations. We are not studying numbers. We are not studying maths. Human behavior. But of course, we don't study human behavior in general terms with all its facets. There are psychology, psychologists doing the same. There are anthrop anthropologists doing the same. There are actually architects doing the same, looking at how do we build all the buildings, build where do we build what. We look at human behavior as a relationship between given ends and scarce means. Second point. Given ends, scarce means. We have resources, then you can look, you, you can use different terms. We have resources, we have ends, we want to achieve something with scarce means. There is some problem with scarcity meaning they don't match. Ends and means don't match. And now the third point of the definition, the second point of this relationship is which have alternative uses. If we don't have an alternative, we don't have to think about it. We just have to do what we can do. And there's, it, or, this is only one thing. But here, for economics, we have alternatives. We can choose between different ways, different ways of looking or relating ends and means. In some way, you can say this is the entire thing we are interested in. Everything what comes is detailed. Everything that comes is specifying what is human behavior. Because, of course, there are psychological things playing, playing a role. How far do we engage with that? Given ends, scarce, uh, scarce means. We are looking there at some issues of technology, biology chemistry, whatsoever, culture. But we are not interested in the entire complexity, but we have to know it, we have to keep it in mind. Then we have to think about what is alternative. For us, the alternatives are different than they are for political science. 
we are looking simply at an economic relationship means at supply, demand, and production. Production, supply, and demand. We are not interested in changing the world, changing the economic system. We are, some of us are, but in strict terms, this is not part of economics you are studying. Be aware of it, because it is important that there is an alternative of dealing with alternatives. Political economy and economics is a study of mankind. There you have, again, human behavior. In ordinary business life, it's important as well, it's not big business only. It is ordinary business life, business of life. It examines that part, that part of individual and social action which is most closely connected with the attainment and with the use of material requisites of well-being. You can spend now two weeks on this. What is well-being? What are material, relevant material resources? What is the attainment and what is the use? Attainment is as well, if I just say I like this and take it, as long as I'm strong enough and you cannot defend yourself or your property, that's a way of attaining material requisites. Of course, this plays a role as well in economics, different power relationships, but again, this is not the core of what comes later in terms of distribution, redistribution. And then we have this term of well-being. What is well-being? Is everything of feeling better, feeling well, is that meant here? Some people like the sun shining and it's very warm, and some people like rain and storm and a nice fireplace. Of course, there are material things playing a role. You have to have the stuff for the fireplace. You have to have the fireplace. You don't need heating if you like the warm and you are in the warm. But how far is well-being defined or how is well-being defined in economics? It's an ongoing discussion of what is relevant for economics when it comes to well-being. Thus it is on the, on the one side a study of wealth. Again, a hugely problematic term. What is wealth? I talked the other day to some classmates. Um, there is a new term frequently used time wealth. Opposing or standing against this, I'm busy, I don't have time. I could give you two minutes there and we could talk five minutes there, but I'm really so busy. And actually I'm not sleeping anymore because I don't have time. And other people have time. They are wealthy in terms of having time. They can study. They can read books. Remember the Mexican fish farm? He was time wealthy. The MBI guy, he didn't have time. He always was thinking, what is the next and how can I make more rent? And, and. So what is wealth? We have to think about this as well. And of course we have to think about it in longer term perspectives. Because you may be very wealthy now, in terms of material things, you may be uh, time poor. And when you work this way, and you end up with 35 with a heart attack, in the wheelchair, completely wrecked and burned out, you don't have anything. 
because then you have time, but you cannot use it anymore, because, because you are more or less crippled, you are sick, and you don't have material wealth anymore, or only that what you saved from your wealthy times. So it is important to keep in mind we have to define this term as well. And on the other hand, and more important side, a part of study of men. Again, human behavior, what do we want to do? And this is, of course, what do we want to do as individuals with our personal life? But as well, how do we relate to others? And these are hugely problematic things. I was recently asked to do something and did it, namely joining somebody to, um, to, present, to, to, to presenting a presentation at, at her school. And she said, it's, it, it was a private school, and she said, these children who are here, children, three, four years, they are here, the parents pay a huge amount of money for it because they don't have time to look after the children. What do we do, what do we want to do in relation to others? Now you can say this is really very bad and, and they should stay at home and look after the children. Now you can say as well, and I say it to, to make it difficult, you can say as well, you have one child, this poor child is always together with these stupid adults or parents who tell them what to do. They don't have space to explore their environment. They don't have uh, opportunities to link to their peers. So let them go to play with their peers, to play with other children, pay for it, you go to work, which means something for you as well. You can do what, what you like, what you had been trained for, and then you still have time to do something together. So don't say simply, well, this is not good, this is not good, this is the golden rule. It's always difficult, but we have to think about in these terms of how do we relate to others in the society we are living in? Because, of course, in, a, in another society, we would have opportunities as well to organize things in a different way. And we talked about it. And we come back to the definition of economics. There are different ways of dealing, of organizing our life in terms of these material requirements of what we need. Subsistence production is, in very simple terms, you produce what you need, not less, not more. It's just enough. <coughs> And you do it for yourself, which means you do it individually, or as well, it means you do it for your community, whatever this community is. It's a family, it's the tribe, or something like this. There are different ways of, of defining the subsistence, the borders of subsistence, but this is something we are always dealing with, defining borders. And you can see the importance today when we do not speak anymore simply and solely of the nation state. Up to a couple of years ago, it was clear that the nation state was the point of reference. China, full stop. Russia, full stop. Brazil, full stop. India, full stop. South Africa, full stop. Now you have the BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. 
still nation states, nevertheless having a different shape in respect of collaboration, of relating to others. And the BRICS stand there, and there stands the United, nation, uh, the United States, and there stands another thing of NAFTA, there stands the EU, and, and you have all these agglomerations. Still nation states, but they have a different role to play now. Subsistence is you produce what you need for yourself. And then the next stage, if you want, is exchange. And you still produce what you need, what you want. But there is this process of exchange, of direct exchange. You have one good, one commodity. Well, it's not a commodity, really. But you have one good and exchange it against another. So let's make a good, let's make a product. You have chairs, you have tables. What should you do with tables without chairs? What should you do with, with chairs without tables? So exchange them. And you, you produce what you need, and you produce what somebody else needs, and you directly exchange. And you can do it still on a little bit higher scale, and you say, OK, there is money inter inter intervening. It's not two people, two parties exchanging, but three. A sells to B, gets money, and then you have C, and they deal with money as intermittent. And then you have, and we talked extensively about it, you have the market production. You produce basically with the intention, with the goal to sell it on the market. And now the use value is going into the background of this entire process and you are interested not in the use, primarily in the use value, but primarily in the exchange value. Of course, use value still plays a role, because if nobody can use it, nobody will buy it. But you are not interested in what the other person does with it. If somebody buys a pig or a hen, if they put it into their bedroom because they love it, or if they slaughter it because they love it so much that they eat it, that doesn't bother you. You want to sell the thing. So production for the market, production to sell something, and of course production at the end of the day, and here we are talking about commodities, exchanging commodities, getting money, Buying commodities and buying more or better commodities for your purpose. This is the difference between simple exchange and this market process. You want to get more out of it. I quoted Polanyi the orientation now on gain. This is the purpose of this entire process. Now, production is, as I said, we have to talk a little bit, or we have to think a little bit, about technology. Production is, as well, about the technology we have at hand, the technology we can use. The slides, or the blackboard, or nothing, just the words. We talked about factors of production. Different from the factors of production are the means of production. 
The means of production are simply, it's complicated enough, the tools and machines, the, techno the technology I use to enter the process of production. It's not human labor, labor power, it's the machines and tools. And as I said, we have to go a little bit into thinking about technology, that there is a huge difference between tools and machines. Tools allow simple production. There is a tool which is a kind of direct medium, stands directly between me and what I'm doing. I have the chalk, in a way it's a tool, and I draw a line on the blackboard. The machine is different, and you find actually such machines. You put 10 pieces of chalk into it, and for whatever reason you use it, they draw automatically always a line. It's not you. You only look at the machine, you feed the machine, and the machine does the work. So it's a more complex thing. And for this machine you need as well, if you want external energy. If you have a hammer, you have to use it. If you have chalk, you have to use it. The machine is something that has a different source of energy. This is as well important when we think today about it, and I'm not expert in this, I'm hesitating to say simply it's about tools and machines. Because machines today, if we talk about robots, we talked a little bit about them and saw this thing there walking, is this a machine? Is it a tool? Or is it a new stage of machine? I leave it to experts in linguistics, if they want to speak of machines, part of machines, or if they have a different term there. There's a huge debate about it, how independent these things are really. But we should keep it in mind. Relations of production is another thing. We use these terms, these, these means. And the way in which we, as workers, interact with these tools and machines is called relations of production. It depends on technology, but here we are talking about how do we deal with it? How do we deal with this technological process? And then we have the mode of production, which is again linked to it, but different. And it is the way in which we use or organize society. in relation to the means of production and in relation of the relations of production. And here you find the typical large political questions, and this is why I said we are not really dealing with it immediately, but in political economy actually we do it. But even more so, we do it in political science. Do we want to have a market society? What do we understand under market society? In which way do we accept inequality? How do we organize the ruling, the determination, the hierarchies of these processes? All this is part of the way of organizing production and with this shaping society. And as 
I'm sure that you all read this text from Frederick Engels at this stage. There's on page 96 the sentence. The bourgeoisie broke up the feudal system and built upon its ruins the capitalist order of society, the kingdom of free competition, of personal liberty, of the equality before the law, of all commodity owners. You can read this one sentence for one hour. There is so much in it. You have all the legal implications. You have the specification of what law is, what equality is. And this is important to keep this in mind and to come back to it occasionally, to think what it is. To think as well about this one thing that seems to easily to hide away, the bourgeoisie broke up the feudal system, broke up the feudal system. And this was a huge step actually in terms of the means of production. Before, it was not a self-sufficient society, only based on subsistence production. But it was a society of people who had not been equal, the lord and the peasant, the peasant working for the lord. It was mainly about agriculture, a little bit more, building the palaces of the lords and stuff. And the peasant did have a little bit of own soil and could work on this. This was really subsistence production. Now there had been new means of production. We come back to it a little bit later. But you did not simply work with your own hands and a little bit of tools. But in a way, you have had tools and machines working for you. And these had been social relationships completely changing. Before, in the olden societies, you basically followed, if you want, the law of nature. nature. You got up with the sun, you planted the crop, you harvest it according to the climate. But within this framework, you had been independent. If you came an hour late, it was basically fine. You had to catch up with the hour, but it was your decision. If you worked very fast, you gained time, and you could end a little bit early. Modern times, Charlie Chaplin. This was later, this was the later industrialization, Fordism, and this stuff. But this was a new stage of production determined completely by machines. The machine started at 8 o'clock, which meant you had to be there at 7.59. And not a minute later. And not at 5 past 8. Because this machine needed you. There you are. Somewhere there you are. There you are. And this is where you are. You are standing fulfilling the task of the machine. We have had this earlier. As I said, this is late. We have had this, especially in the cotton industry, and the invention of the steam engine. If we see a steam engine today, we think, well, this is just 
such an old stuff. What could you do with this? You could revolutionize the entire way of production. This was an energy that was simply unknown before. This was amazing. This is something comparable with when I tell you, actually you don't know it yet, but I know it, tomorrow you can go to the train station and there's an air shuttle and bringing you to the Mars. And in one week you come back. This was the dimension in a way we are talking about. Something unbelievable that you have 10 workers replaced or even more by this steam engine, which seems to us just old-fashioned, dirty stuff. You have had it, especially the steam engine and in the cotton industry. Technical details, we don't have to look at it. It was as well something due to national traditions, meaning it was happening in England. There had been certain ideolo ideologies behind it, namely that the uh, English Enlightenment was different to the French. It's good to know it, but you don't have to know all these details. But you have to consider something happened, and it happened in a certain place, and there is a reason for it. And under certain conditions, we have to look at these reasons. And then we find chaos, again. And we like it. We like chaos. We, we like just drawings and lines and different colors and different shades and going up and down and not knowing what is happening and seeing some figures there for years. And then seeing something which we don't understand, namely Kondratiev waves. A Russian economist who did not do much else than looking at figures and coming up with this, not with this, but with the similar chaotic order of things. And looking at it and saying, this is so strange. Is there any order in it? Can I figure out from what I see, can I see something more in terms of detail? Is there a system behind it? Now, for you, this is easier to understand. For me, this is much easier. Because I have the specific forms of the lines. I don't know. I have to search them, and I don't know where they are, let alone that I know what they mean. But here I have certain lines, I can count them, how much, certain sizes, it makes things easy. It's beautiful. For stupid people like me, and for people like economists who, who get a little bit stupid after seeing all this complexity, and then actually saying there is some pattern behind it. If we look at it in a longer perspective, if we take out the details, we see a certain pattern which looks like this. Roughly. And then I go to history and go to the reality, away from the figures, and look what happened actually during these years when we have these strange figures and a certain regularity coming up. What is happening there? And then he said the first major shift was the steam engine and the cotton industry. And of course this had been discussed before him. This was the major thing of all the important economists at that time, saying there is something new coming up, the new machinery and, and the entire re restructuring of, of production of the economy. Now he said, this happened there, but then we have another second commentary, railway and steel. 
So you see, on the one hand, it's the means of production, and then there is something linked to raw material. Rayboy steel, and then he goes on through the figures and finds another wave, another major cycle, as he called it, was electric engineering and chemistry. And at some stage, you think there's something interesting happening. Especially if you go further and say petrochemicals and automobiles. Another one. And then he passed away. Or not. And then somebody came up. Actually, he passed away before. But then something else came up and information technology. I don't know if it's silicon or whatever is behind it as raw material. But this is another change. And he said, we have this basic pattern that looks like a wave. We have an invention, a, a major technological change. Then we have developing prosperity because we can produce more, we can produce easier. But then at some stage there is a recession, there is a saturation of the market. We produced enough now, and enough means there is not enough or yeah, not sufficient demand. But still we produce a little bit further, and then we go into the depression. Meaning, then it goes really down. And then it goes massively down. But who wants to stay down there? And you have the entire economy involved about this technological change. Enterprises go down, bosses don't make money anymore, don't make profit, workers don't get a job. Workers cannot go to the shop and buy something, so you, the, the entire economy is going down, just due to this one sector. And then somebody else comes up and says, hey, I have something. I just invented a railway. And actually, I know there's something steel we can do with it. Of course, it's not as simple as that. But what you have is, with a steam engine, with a cotton, you prepare in a way, the need, the want, for new ways of production. As I said, the saturation of the market was not simply that there had been enough produced, but there was not sufficient demand. Meaning, if you easily transport this stuff by a railway, there is a new market opening. Steel, and then you go on and go on, and you have these circles. Now, this is, a, is contested, but it is something that helps you to understand the means of, or, or the, the meaning of technology in this process. And if you look at it today, you see exactly this that we have a major change going on with this information technology, whatever it is.